Buongiorno, buonasera, benvenuti a tutti quanti. Uh, siamo particolarmente contenti di essere qui con il dottor Henry Marsh. Henry Marsh è un uh, neurochirurgo inglese, in uh, passato è stato uh, senior consultant al St. George's Hospital di Londra ed è anche un vero e proprio uh, pioniere uh, della neurochirurgia in Ucraina, da dove lavora, da, a, con, lavora in maniera um, continua da quasi, da quasi 30 anni per promuovere l'avanzamento della neurochirurgia all'interno del sistema sanitario ucraino, ma anche per formare e insegnare una nuova generazione di eh, chirurghi e neurochirurghi ucraini. Nel corso degli anni eh, quindi è diventato anche un grande conoscitore del paese e sul suo lavoro è stato fatto anche un, un bel documentario della BBC chiamato The English Surgeon, eh, troverete il, il link in descrizione, è anche autore di tre libri, Uh, Do No Harm, Stories of Life, Death and Brain Surgery, tradotto anche in italiano come Primo Non Nuocere, Storia di Vita, Morte e Neurochirurgia. L'altro è Admissions, a Life and Brain Surgery. E l'ultimo, edito quest'anno, And Finally, Matters of Life and Death. Uh, se volete approfondire su questi temi potrete, tro pot potrete trovare tutti i link in descrizione. Dr. Marsh, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Really a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to asking you more about your work, your extraordinary work in, in Ukraine. Um, but the, the first thing I would like to start from really is um, how does a British neurosurgeon end up in Ukraine in the 1990s? Can you tell us a bit more about your story? Well, now? It's a combination of my family background um, and chance and luck. When we look back on our lives, we tend to think it was all you know, rational, planned decisions. In reality, we sort of dodge around like molecules in Brownian motion, Brownian motion, and then claim we were in charge afterwards. My, my mother was a political refugee from Nazi Germany. She had to get out of Germany quickly, just before the war, because she was in trouble with the Gestapo and married my father. My father was McCable, was a human rights lawyer, one of the first sort of international human rights lawyer, lawyers when <clears throat> the end of the great empires, um, particularly France and in Britain, meant you needed a new sort of world legal order. And my father was very much involved in that. They were both deeply idealistic people. So I'm the youngest of four, and I was all brought up with a strong feeling they weren't they didn't push it that one should try to make the world a better place there was no science in the family and i went through this expensive private english education a very good one which was mainly doing latin and greek and history and it was kind of inevitable i did politics and philosophy and economics at oxford university and in fact i specialized in soviet politics and i think I had this profound interest in the history of Europe in the middle of the last century and in totalitarian politics and the horrors of it. For various reasons that needn't detain us, and I felt unhappy in love. I kind of threw it all over. And although I completed my degree um, at Oxford, I then went to London and became a doctor. And I wanted to be a surgeon because I liked using my hands And I had this idea that medicine involved one's head and one's hands. I was rather disappointed when I became a doctor. I found it rather dull. And then by chance again, <clears throat> I saw a neurosurgical operation on an aneurysm in, in somebody's head. And I immediately knew this was what I wanted to do. It was exciting, dangerous, a bit glamorous and dramatic, but very fiddly done using a microscope and I found it quite irresistible and then many years later by chance when I was already a senior doctor an English businessman in 1992 who was a trader with Russia and Ukraine was looking for an English neurosurgeon to come out to give some lectures on neurosurgery in Kiev because or Kiev as it was then had one of the two major Soviet um, brain surgical hospitals. And that's how I went. And when I was there, I, I was appalled 
I knew things would be bad, but it was terrible. Um, and I met a very, very dynamic, driven young doctor who came out and spent several months working with me in England. The National Health Service is a much more generous, relaxed, less bureaucratic organization 30 years ago than it is now. And I would go out to Ukraine regularly, mainly to Kiev, to, to work with him, to help him and treat patients. And we achieved great things in many ways. We're doing, I took a lot of equipment out with me, secondhand microscopes and the like, which I either begged or bought uh, myself. But as the years went by and he became more and more successful and more and more famous, he became more and more sort of totalitarian. And he started sort of morphing into the very sort of dictatorial autocratic Soviet professors whom I thought I was helping him rebel against in many ways. And after 20 years, I decided I'd stop working with him. I now work with some other different doctors. It's increasingly lectures and sort of literary, as my books have been bestsellers in Ukraine, um, rather than operating, though I still occasionally help out with surgery. <clears throat> and because of the war, um, I haven't been there. I was there twice last year. And I'm going back there, in fact, next week, much to my wife's dismay, although I think that I won't go to the front line. Um, neurosurgery is a very small part of battlefield surgery, so it's not really what I'm doing. I'm more interested in education and training, <clears throat> trying to bring in slightly what I regard as slightly more civilized medical ethics into what's still a fairly rather autocratic Soviet medical system. Um, and there are lots and lots of problems. But I, I became very committed to Ukraine long before I never suspected there'd be this catastrophic war. But I did understand right from the start, and because of my background in Soviet politics, uh, I understood that Ukraine was a very important country. What are European politics? It's on the borderline between the more liberal West and the autocratic, dictatorial East. And we see that now in a quite horrifying, extreme form. What the war is really about is Putin trying to preserve his um, autocratic kleptocracy from the more liberal democratic forces, which have become increasingly strong in Ukraine over the, last, over the 30 years that I've been going there. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, because most people, you know, wouldn't be familiar necessarily with, you know, what the healthcare situation was in a post-Soviet Ukraine when you first arrived there. Can, can you give us just a sense of, of what you found when you well, first Well, I mean, it was, it was very in, my own, in my own specialty of brain surgery, there was only one very poor quality brain scanner in the whole of Ukraine. Um, they had no microscopes, they had no modern operating at all. It was basically about 50 years out of date compared to the West. But also because of the, the disrupt, economic disruption that followed the end of the Soviet Union, it was even worse. There was virtually nothing happening in the hospitals and the medicine they were practicing, they didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have disinfectants, it was terrible. But that was 30, 31 years ago and there's been enormous progress since then. But one has to remember Ukraine is the poorest country in Europe. And, you know, even before the war, there were still lots of lots of problems, although there'd been lots of progress as well. Now, because of the war, of course, it's it's unimaginable, really. And I, it's very hard to know what will happen, both in terms of the outcome of the war. And even if Ukraine is successful in some way, <clears throat> there are going to be so many problems. Yeah, that's definitely one one point to go back to. But uh, you mentioned earlier on, you know, the, um, you know, your attempt to try and and bring a different uh, ethical approach yes. to yeah. medicine. And Can you more, give us and a more scientific more approach? Scientific. The, the, the yeah, importance of evidence, the 
importance of being more open about mistakes, which is a problem with all doctors all over the world anyway, but is a particular problem in the Soviet, post-Soviet countries, because all healthcare systems reflect their underlying societies. And the Soviet Union was completely monolithic. And the Ukrainian medical system is still pretty monolithic in a very, a very vertical hierarchy. It's a lot more horizontal in Britain, but of course Britain at the moment has loads of problems of healthcare, but that's another, that's another story. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another story, but, um, and uh, you had to, you've been to Russia as well, I, yes. I, I think. In the, 19, uh, I, in the 1990s, I, I did some, I sort of collaborated with some Russian neurosurgeons in Moscow, and in fact, the deputy head of all of neurosurgery for Russia, I, I operated on him. He didn't trust his colleagues. <laughs> so it was a simple spinal operation. So he came to London and I operated on him. But that, that was sort of 25 years ago. Right. And um, in a way, like, the, the very interesting thing is that, you know, through the lens of, of medicine, but also, you know, through your experience of going to Ukraine, like, regularly for what is now 30 years, you, you know, you very much witnessed the, you know, the change that the country has been yes. going through. You were there at, like, crucial yeah. moments, like, you know, 2014 and so on. How have you seen the country change over these three decades? Well, there's there's a new generation. Of course, it's been depopulated. The population's gone even before the war. The population had dropped from sort of 50 million to I think about 45 million. It was one of the most rapidly shrinking countries yeah. in the world. And that's obviously been hugely exacerbated um, by the war. Um, but there is a, a new generation of younger people who have been born since the end of the Soviet Union, who look to Europe as their model, to Western Europe. And of course, Ukraine, Western Ukraine, was never part of Russia anyway. It was part of Poland and Habsburg, Austro-Hungary. Um, and that's where Ukrainian nationalism was always at its most intense. And the history of Ukraine is very complicated and horrifying. I and mean, everybody was killing each other. You know? Um, everybody was killing the Jews, the Germans were killing everybody, the Russians were killing everybody, the Poles were killing the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians were killing the Poles. Bloodshed everywhere. About a quarter of the population died from either famine or violence in the 20th century, which is horrifying, but it also means the Ukrainians are incredibly tough uh, and, uh, and they put up with things I find unimaginable. I guess one reason why the war is going the way it has, because they are very, very bloody-minded people. Bloody-minded in the, the good sense of very tough and very stubborn. And of course, just as Brexit has hugely strengthened the European Union, I mean, no European country in its right mind would now want to leave the EU, seeing what's happened to our poor country. Likewise, Putin has hugely strengthened the Ukraine's sense of nationhood because you know, Eastern, Eastern Ukraine was very Russophile. Russian was the first language. Um, and even now, there is still some support for the Russians in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Ukraine, but obviously not very much. And going back to what you said earlier um, about um, your experience of going to Ukraine. I mean, you've, you've yeah. been there now, I think, more than once since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what your experience was? And also... Well, it's, it's rather see. strange, because I've only been in the way in Kiev and Lviv. And although the second time I was in Kiev, the cruise missiles arrived at exactly the same time as I did at the railway station. So it was a bit... It was interesting. Um... But on the whole, and I was there before the, all the before the winter and the blackouts and the attempts to <clears throat> destroy the energy system. But I mean, life in Lviv and Kiev really, you knew there was a war, but it felt pretty normal. You have to go 500, yeah. 600 kilometers to the east um, to where the, the worst destruction is. Sure, I saw a certain amount of bomb damage. Um, out in the outskirts of the northwest outskirts of Kiev. 
but it, it, it was it was strange. And w what would you say is the main challenge that you know um, Ukrainian doctors are, are facing at the moment? Like uh, aside, of course, from from you know. Um, well, you uh, see, uh, I mean, you see a whole different range of trauma injuries. You see these terrible, terrible facial injuries you get with 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 gunshot wounds and missiles, which are awful, and disfiguring, and horrendous. Um, I mean, you've, they've been fighting a war since 2014. So the Ukrainian military medical system was, you know, it was reasonably well set up and experienced. They don't need more doctors. They just need lots of medical equipment, you know, um, which are permanently in short supply. But as far as I know, um, they, they can manage all the casualties at the moment. As far as I know, I might be wrong. I'm essentially, I'm a civilian doctor. Um, and I'm not the best person to ask what's actually happening in the hospitals at the front line. Although, of course, they will have a knock-on effect on, you know, on, on civilian medicine as well. Because yes, well, that can, that carries on. It was as it was had there were lots of problems with it anyway, despite progress. Um, but it's it's still functioning. It's still functioning. I mean, the, my my colleagues are operating regularly. Sometimes they have to take shelter in an air raid shelter, but but it continues to function as a sort of um, peacetime society. And uh, having had so, you know, a, an experience in terms of, um, of you know, of going to first Russia, then to Ukraine. Um, I mean, of course, you, as you mentioned, you haven't been there in, you haven't been to Russia in a yeah. long time. But like, how would you say, like, you know, the, the, the culture of... of oh, the I, I, I found the Russians difficult to... With a few exceptions, I've got one, one very good friend in St. Petersburg, a fellow neurosurgeon. But on the whole, I found the Russians touchy, arrogant, in an arrogant in a defensive sort of way. They have this belief in the importance, this sort of messianic belief in Russia. It's very, very deep rooted. This rather mystical sense of you know, Mother Russia, and yet they kind of envy the West for its wealth and freedoms. And you see that with all the oligarchs, you know, they all invest their money in, in, in London banks and the like, launder it there. Um, so they have this sort of complicated love-hate relationship with the West. Whereas the Ukrainians, I found on the whole, were much more open-minded. They're historically underdogs, of course. They were underdogs to the Poles, they were underdogs to the Habsburgs, they were underdogs to the Russians. And that I found them much easier to, to work with on the whole, on the whole. But it was still a very hierarchical medical system, which was very much against my view of medicine. Increasingly, as the years went by, I see medicine as essentially as a collaborative exercise. It's not, there's no, it's not this old Beethoven Einstein view of great surgeons. I see medicine fundamentally as teamwork. Right. And I think you said something like, you know, th th that very important earlier about, you know, the, the, the cultural change had to do not only with the ethics, but also with the, you know, with the evidence based scientific. Yes. Yeah, approach. it's no longer the word, you know, it's no longer the expert word of the professor. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a big change in my life working in working in Britain. The 40 years ago, the senior doctors had too much power and autonomy. Now it's gone to the other the other extreme. Um, but on the whole, the Ukrainian medical system is very, very hierarchical with the professor at the top. And of course, as of everything in Ukraine, it's corrupt because that's the way the country has functioned um, with bribery and payments. So the doctors are paid so little in the state sector, they can only survive if patients give them co-payments you can call that bribery you can say it's what is, is necessary that they couldn't live off their state income it's a poor country and the other thing that i, I it, since you mentioned corruption i think that you know one thing that i found you know very interesting for example in in, in the film the english surgeon was like you know how um there was you know, even difficult yet establishing a system of queuing up, you know, for the patients to queue oh, up. Oh, yes. I mean, Ukrainians don't do queuing very well. They're, 
They're not quite as bad as the Germans, but they don't chew on the whole thing. <laughs> but I think that it, what what resonated with me, what what it made me think about, is that, and it, I think this would be interesting for for you know for, for our audience, is that especially in Italy, I mean, among the uh, you know among a section of society, there definitely was, and maybe there still is some kind of idealistic and nostalgic or in a weird way view of, of, of what the Soviet system was. And there is very little understanding of the level of corruption yeah. and inefficiency yeah. that was yeah. in it. No, exactly. No, I mean, again, the older generation in Ukraine and Russia greatly miss the Soviet time. They had regular pensions, but that had been changing in, in Ukraine. And again, again, East Ukraine is different from West Ukraine. I mean, almost, almost all the Western Ukrainians all hate the Russians because I don't, none of my friends don't have great grandparents or grandparents who weren't either killed or sent to Siberia, to the Gulag. Um, so uh, there's no, there's very, there was very little nostalgia for the people over the years I worked in, in Ukraine. And it was, it was a deeply, I mean, it was a highly inefficient, it was highly corrupt, highly inefficient. Um, you know, they had the educational system was was quite strong. It was some areas of science are very strong. Medicine was terrible on the whole, and corrupt. You had to pay, you know, in the Soviet time, you always had to pay extra money to doctors to be treated. Yeah, and 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 as you said, treatment was not very often evidence based or. No, it like wasn't. No, there was, well, I mean, there was no. It's changed in Ukraine, but when I first went there. <clears throat> there was not the division between what we call alternative medicine and, and conventional medicine. The basic distinction is conventional medicine on the whole is based on evidence and alternative medicine is all, you know, herb, herbal therapy and all sorts of stuff. But in, in, in the Ukraine, I was amazed to find doctors practicing what I would call um, her, you know, can, alternative medicine as, as mainline medical treatment. Um, you know, they had radon gas inhalations for asthma, underwater traction for, for backache, uh, and optical nerve stimulation for blindness. I mean, complete voodoo nonsense. Um, but it also reflected the fact that they had very little effective treatment anyway, because the system was so, was so under-resourced and so backward. And that, I think, has changed over the years. But... but uh, but the need for co-payments, corruption, has not changed. And the educational system remains very poor, I think, the po particularly the postgraduate medical. There's no proper structured um, national training program um, for doctors after qualifying, which we have in, in most of Europe. It's coming along slowly, but it's, it's not very good. And the other thing I was I was struck about um, from from the, some of the stories also in the documentary was um, how many cases you know it was so you know it would so often be that something was diagnosed too late like there were, like this kind of delay yeah, well, that, that happened that happens in poor countries all over the world. I mean, having said that, in Ukraine, one of the first changes after as the economy improved in the uh, particularly in the early early years of this century was there were lots and lots of private brain scanners and diagnostic stuff. And in fact, a very large part of my work when I made my medical visits was telling people they didn't need surgery. A brain scan had shown some minor problem and some enthusiastic, rather ignorant Ukrainian doctor had said, you've got to have an operation. Uh, and again, the problem is in America, an awful lot of medicine in Ukraine is essentially commercial, there's for profit. And although I did private medicine in England as well as mainly working for the NHS, it is, it is a problem if you have a commercial healthcare system where the patient is no longer an end in itself. The patient becomes a means to the end of making money. And that can be very corrupting. And I saw a lot of that in Ukraine where, of over-treatment, just like, it was rather ironical and I saw so much overtreatment in Ukraine, just as I have very strong connections with American neurosurgery, just as I saw what, from my point of view, was an awful lot of overtreatment in America at the other end of the economic scale. <laughs>
Yes, and in, and in fact, I mean, it was in my uh, limited personal experience in Ukraine, like you know, in in, in deep, you know, in terms of, of private medicine, like you can find pretty much anything that you know as as good as it as it gets. But of course, the huge difference is the is in the public. Uh, yes, in the public. Same, yeah, the private, the new. I mean, I've been. I was last time I was there. I was uh, time before last in the private hospital called Dobrobut in Kiev. I mean, it was fantastic. You know, beautifully set up, very nice bit of architecture, very well equipped, but very expensive. And Ukraine is a very poor, very unequal country. I mean, there was a smaller number of oligarchs in Ukraine owning almost fifty percent of the economy than than in Russia. Now, hopefully. That hopefully that would all change because of the war. But of course, the economy has been pretty well wrecked by the war. And, and there'll need to be a huge amount of money invested in Ukraine to rebuild the country. And, you know, you then think of all the money that was wasted in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and it's going to be a big problem. But I, I'm all for it. You know, I'm committed to the country. Just there are lots of problems doesn't mean we should abandon it. In fact, it's very important we don't abandon it because you know, the war is a major threat to the whole rules-based world order, which was established after the ghastly nightmare of the Second World War. And with all the coming problems of climate change, if we're back to the dog-eat-dog -dog international politics of the past, it'll be even worse. It's going to be terrible anyway. But we do need to maintain some semblance of a rules-based international order. And the war's about that, as well as about trying to save Ukraine from the Russians. And you mentioned, uh, I mean, definitely when, when you started going to Ukraine, you wouldn't have expected, you know, this development in, in the long run. Was there a moment in time of the past few years where you thought that something like this might be coming? No. I mean, because the war has been going no. on since... No, no, never, never. I don't think very few people expected it because it was so obviously a very bad idea. <laughs> it was, it was really yeah. Which, which is part of you know the reason why the Ukrainians themselves, at some point, seem like dismissing the notion of of an invasion because it just looks such a like such exactly. an absurd yeah. idea yeah. from their point of view. And although American and British intelligence were quite clear in the months before the war there would be an invasion. I, you know, before the Putin started moving all his troops to the border and all that, I, I don't think anybody expected this. And it was, it was well, it was, it was necessary, I suppose you could say it was necessary for Putin in the sense that he, you know, the Maidan, first of all, the Orange Revolution, then the Maidan Revolution. I was at Maidan for much of a lot of the time. Um, was a huge threat. You know, that sort of freedom came to Russia. It would spell the end of his regime. Um, so the war is, for Putin, it's the war of survival of his kleptocratic regime, without a doubt. But you're justified by all this mystical Mother Russia stuff, which is why so many Russians support it, alas, you know, which I undoubtedly do. As well as, it, of course, they've had completely... Only 25% of the population have access to the internet. Um, and the, if you've seen some of these Russian television programs, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, Goebbels and Himmler, you know, um, not, not, very, just not very different. <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned you, you, were, you were in Ukraine in 2014, you were at Maidan. Yes. Um, how, how was your experience of that? How is how it's wonderful? I I was, I was, I was, yeah, revolutions are great. I can't <laughs> recommend them strongly enough. And also because Yanukovych was ghastly, you know, totally corrupt, great bastard. So well, they've been elected democratically. Um, even Amici started subverting democracy, just as Hitler did. So I, I know some of the people who say it's all the West's fault, you know, Maidan was a coup d'etat against the democratically elected government. But I mean, anybody with knowledge of political theory, if you have a democratically elected leader who then starts to destroy democracy, as Yanukovych yeah. was doing, I mean, the revolution is not wrong. I mean, it's not satisfactory, but it's, it's not wrong. 
Yeah, I think I think that's one element that a lot of people would say that sort of things uh, either ignore or choose to ignore is, of course, the you know the the authoritarian you know direction that you know coverage was. What does that you know, mean? Exactly. That I mean, mind. the typical corruption. His son was a dentist who rapidly became one of the wealthiest men in Ukraine. How well if you ran a successful business, um, the, the people would come along and say, if you don't hand over the business to us. At a cheap price, we're going to conduct a criminal prosecution into you, and you might have, and you'll, you'll end up going to prison, which was the Putin Russian playbook as well. Um, so, you know, Yanukovych's son rapidly became this huge big businessman because the, the fundamental point is the importance of the rule of law. I didn't, I, I always thought law was very boring. I had no interest in what my father did, even though I now know in retrospect it was actually a very important man. Um, but the rule of law is fundamental to freedom and democracy. And although justice in Ukraine was still very imperfect, it was still who paid the judge the biggest, often who paid the judge the biggest bribe or who had the most political clout. You know, the, the, without the rule of law, democracy is, is meaningless. Um, and I see the, the fight in Ukraine, as a, for a rules-based world order, but also ultimately to establish an independent judiciary, which is the foundation of all our freedoms, which we rather take for granted in Western Europe, I think. Yeah, and I think in that sense, one of the challenges, of course, is that, you know, one of the things about the war, I mean, on top, of course, of the terrible and, you know, horror that we've been yeah. seeing, on the other hand, like there are some things, you know, there are, there are some changes happening that the war gives you the illusion that can happen faster than yes. it used to. But then, of course, there will be the issue, you know, whenever the war will be over, you know, whatever the end is, I don't, you know, at this point, oh, you know, no, yeah. there's no much point speculating about that. But, you know, there will be the struggle not only to rebuild, but also, you know, to keep that, you know, path of reforms yes. and so on. Well, I mean, on the other hand, I tried to think optimistically about the way at the end of the Second World War, in Britain, the soldiers all came back, and Churchill, although a greatly loved war leader, was kicked out because yeah. people said, we want to change the social system. And the Labour government did. You know, now nationalising everything has gone out of fashion. Maybe there are some things we need to renationalise in Britain. Um, so I would like to think that when the war is over, God willing, you know, the many Ukrainians, what were you fighting for? If we're just going to go back to the old corrupt oligarchy, you know, what, what was the point of the war? So I'd hope the war would be a, to push for change. But, you know, it's going to be very difficult to that. There's no doubt. Also because, of the you know, the one, you know, I, I, I'm careful to say positive, but, you know, one thing about... About what about the war is that he has also brought a lot of civil society into. Oh yeah, into, and, the vol and the volunteering is just is amazing. Yeah. it's quite extraordinary. The degree of I mean, a lot of people have fled. Some of them not entirely for good reasons, you know. So, um, so I mean, and, and many Ukrainians who stayed behind look rather askance at people who've left. You know, we're we're Definitely. staying in fight. You know, it, it's, it's it's difficult. Um, but it is extraordinary the degree of volunteering going on. Yeah, and I think in, in, in that sense, that's something that, you know, that started, you know, I mean, Ukraine has had a, a, a strong, like, probably a stronger civil society since since the Orange Revolution. But th yeah. this level of volunteerism, like, really started in Maidan when, when, when you were yes. there. And yeah. it, it kind of, you know, kept going since then. And I think it's one of the many things about Ukraine that in a lot of Western countries was completely missed. Like this this change, this societal change that yeah. was happening over the past and it's, eight and years. It, and it's generational. It's a young generational who did not grow up in the Soviet Union. And of course, over the last three years, you know, you know, people may have different opinions or definitely had different opinions of, of, of the current government before the beginning of the war. But definitely since 2019, there also have like an influx of like younger <laughs> people from different backgrounds into politics. Well, I mean, I, my, my friends, I, mean, I suppose, I mean, you could all be more fairly intellectual. They absolutely loathe Zelensky, you know. Yeah, um, similar and experience. Even, and even now, they a bit reluctant to admit he's doing a good job, but my God, he is, you know. 
It may be always got very good advisors, an absolutely spectacularly good PR team. Um, no, he's, he's been quite remarkable and it comes as a surprise. You don't really expect TV actors who performed at Yanukovych's birthday party to, uh, to become great war leaders. That is quite remarkable. And in, in, in that sense, what do you think will be the, the main challenges? I mean, of course, the, the, you know, the rebuilding, but there is also like, in terms of, of that corruption you were, you were talking about, you know, yeah. there is institutional corruption, there's corruption inside institutions. And that- oh, Absolutely. It's and it goes throughout, it, I mean, on the other side of the coin, corruption is also helping each other, you know. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what I think I was, I was getting at. And those yeah, are like two sides of the coins that are very difficult to- you can, to, said you could, the doctors have, in the state sector, the doctors have to be paid by the patients because they couldn't live off their government income, you know. So, and it also comes from a from a past in which the state was very much seen as an enemy of exactly. the something again people in the West don't understand is to live in the country where the state is against you, you know, and that's a very difficult attitude to, to change. And people are very reluctant to pay taxation because they say, oh, that goes into the pockets of the people in charge, <clears throat> which is why you know a fairly low flat rate taxation on the whole seems to work best. But you know, Ukraine is not not Northern Europe, nor is Northern Europe, Southern Europe, you know. So, but all I can do is continue to go there. I'm very well known in Ukraine because it's obviously rather unusual that an Englishman should have devoted so much time and trouble for 30 years to this, this rather, previously a rather obscure country. And I don't have any rose-tinted spectacles about it at all. I, <clears throat> I've often found working there very, very difficult and very infuriating. But, you know, one, it's my upbringing, coming back to my parents. One has to throw pebbles on a pile and hope gradually things get a bit better. Because all that's certain is if you don't try to make things better, they won't get better. You know? it's, it's a very simple rule in life. But you have to accept you'll fail, and I reckon I've achieved very little. <laughs> wow. no, I do, I mean, that's easily, but, but that doesn't bother me. I, I'll go on trying. You know? That's the important thing. And obviously my Ukrainian friends, which is really why I'm going back next week, is not so much to be a clever doctor, but I'll probably do a few meetings and talk to some journalists probably and things like that. And I, I've written a few articles for the main online newspaper, Ukrainska Pravda, which a friend of mine translates, is just to make them feel, you know, they're important and we love them, you know, and they've not been forgotten, which is very important. Well, and in a way, you know, you, you, you a testament to, to you know, the, what we're witnessing now is a testament of, of your early understanding of how important was going to be well, Ukraine. I, I, I'm afraid it is. I mean, I'd come back and say, look, guys, you know, Ukraine's a really important country. And they said, well, Ukraine, where's that? <laughs> what's, what's so special about Ukraine? I said, ah, you know, I then give a historical lecture about it all. And I was right, and, you know. Horrible. Yeah, and I, I think, in, you know, in, in, in closing, one thing I would like to ask you, if, if that's all right, is that, you know, if if you had to say without you know, without going you know, into a long historical lecture, but it, from your point of view, why would you say Ukraine is so important to us and to Europe? Because Russia is a huge threat. It's a threat to the I think to the Baltics and the former Soviet satellite countries, and it's a threat to the world in terms of a, a challenge to the rules based world order. If if Putin is successful in some way. It's a sort of green light to every dictator in the world to start invading foreign countries. Yes, I know it's complicated. America is not an entirely benign, you know, grandfatherly hegemonic power by any means. But they do have the rule of law, you know, <laughs> as we see all the time, like with the cases against Trump and with the cases against Fox News at the moment. So it's all these liberal principles which are, I, I think in many ways are at stake. 
Dr. Marsh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. All right. Okay. It's a pleasure.